Hey, good morning, everybody. Like Joe said, my name is Randy Nickerson. I am a product manager at MCC. I have been involved in thread whirling on Swiss machines for about 23 years now. I think I had one of the first Swiss machines to come into the country uh, that applied thread whirling to it. So I've got a lot of the original knowledge of the way they started and along with being uh, stationed at the New England office where the units have been designed, redesigned, improved along the years. So, a little introduction into thread whirling and what topics we're going to talk about. Uh, there's many different parts to thread whirling. Uh, first, we want to talk about what is thread whirling? What does it do for us? And why do we want to use thread whirling? So which thread whirling unit? There's many different ones for different machines for different reasons that we want to talk about. And some programming samples and also some setup information, uh, basic information as you get may want to get started on this. All right, first, which models have thread whirling? Uh, we've had it for quite a while. So we have really all the L series machines, you know, current machines, the L12, the L20, the L32, uh, the A20. Uh, the the A32, which discontinued, but we, you know, if you have one of those, we have thread whirling available for that. Uh, the K16, the new D25, and all the M series machines, uh, including the new M532. So, what is thread whirling? Thread whirling is just a, a method to produce parts with difficult forms, like an Acme thread, uh, mostly designed or, or applied to the Swiss machines because of the bone screw productions that were needed. Uh, so it's been in existence for over 60 years, but previously there was a special machine that you would buy just for thread whirling. So it was a secondary operation. Uh, since the introduction of bone screws to the in medical industry, it's been a problem getting the bone screws made uh, due to the difficult configuration of the shapes of the, th of the teeth and the numerous design requirements. Uh, past methods to produce, pr produce many con process concepts to achieve the results needed usually at a great expense to time uh, for the end user. Thread whirling will provide a faster and more efficient means to produce the high demanding products. It'll, you know, it'll also reduce upfront engineering, machine setup time and development. It can also produce a more reliable process, giving it better production and better tool life. Previous met methods for producing bone screws or, or special thread shapes, uh, which are many come in many different configurations. The single point threading was used. It was a preferred method, and the cost of the inserts were cheap, economical, and fairly simple process to set up on a machine. Okay, these types of screws have been done in the very same way on a Swiss type machine. The unique, unique challenge with a bone screw on a Swiss type machine involved the sizes of the screws. So very long thread light lengths or varying thread lengths that require being turned the major diameter being turned down to a distance greater than the length of the guide bushing pads. In those cases, single point threading could be a problem because the material needs to pull back or retract out of the guide bushing to allow you to re-enter the thread at the front. So on non-Swiss machines with doing OD threading, uh, you would typically have you know, multiple tools. You had to do a turn and then a thread. And when you're all done, probably return and maybe a, a, a repass of the, the threading tool to get any burrs that may have been rolled down inside it. But as you can see in the animation showing, on a non-Swiss machine, the tool is what's moving across the part. Well, that's great until you get to a small diameter part or a long part where it no, you no longer have the stability to maintain a good cut, a good contact with the material at that, at those lengths. Right, on the Swiss sliding headstock machine, now we, we have the tool that just comes down to the diameter and the material pushes out underneath the tool. But because we do it this way, it gives us much greater strength and you know, diameter control, surface finish control. But if we have to pull it back too far, we, we lose the support of the guide bushing. Guide bushing is like a steady rest. So if we have a single point threading on a Swiss, now we bring the tool down into position in front of the guide bushing. If we bring the tool up to the part so we can turn the, the major diameter of the thread and we cut the, th the major diameter of the thread. One pass like we do on the Swiss so that we don't have to you know, do a rough and finished pass usually. We try not to. But when we have to pull it back so we can take a second pass or bring the threading tool in, 
you can see we're actually still engaged in the guide bushing support pads. So we have strength in that, right? But again, this is with a short thread or short turn. If we have to do a longer thread, now we've got a much longer diameter. And when we pull it back, you can see we're no longer supported by the guide bushing. So if we try to engage the part at this point, the part is just going to deflect away and we're going to get chatter, inconsistent parts. And also if we push the material down when it comes forward, it's going to catch the back of the guide bushing and probably servo the machine out at that point. Now we do have available non guide bushing functions in all of our machines now, but you would run into the same concept as you would with a non Swiss machine, which means if it's small diameter, long threads, it's the stability of the part itself. Okay. In the past, what we did well, when we didn't have thread whirling, or in some cases, maybe you don't have it or, or for whatever reason aren't going to use it, we had a sectioned thread that we came, became known as link threading. And it works well to produce long threads, but it does have some problems. One is blending. When you, you turn the major diameter and then you thread part way down in a section. Um, and it's, then you have to come back with a turning tool and continue turning another section and then come back and thread the second section and the third section and so forth. Well, the problem is blending those points between the sections to make sure that if one, if you're doing a gauge thread, the gauge has to function over the part. If you have a mismatch, it's either going to get sloppy at one point or bind up the gauge and it's not going to give you a good thread. On a bone thread, even though you don't typically have a gauge that we screw over the part, you do have the added problem that it's all visual. They're going to look at these screws under a microscope and see if they can find a mismatch anywhere. So it's actually harder than dealing with the gauge in that respect. So link threading close up is, this video is gonna show here is where it's gonna do the face and the pre-turn, major diameter turn, and then it's gonna come up and thread one section. Sorry for the oil here, but it's, we are cutting steel. It does have to be cooled off. So it does a short thread. Uh, the length of the thread you can get depends on the material and the guide bushing. Uh, usually it could be up to three quarters of an inch of pad in the standard one. But as you get to smaller diameters, because of the tapered angle in the back of the guide bushing, it actually gets less and less. So you can see here, this is the second part of the thread. It had turned twice, now threaded twice. It's going to come and turn a third time. And you're going to, you can continue this and just keep working your way down the bar um, until at some point it's probably going to stick out so much you're going to start getting unstable out at the face. So, right? Now, to do this link threading, if you're, if you're in a position where that's what you need to do, we have a couple editors that we offer that can help you along these lines. First one, which was developed for, for MCC was uh, WinCNC. And in the WinCNC, you can see up here on the top where the icons are, there's a little threading tool icon. If you click on that, it'll bring up this box. And in, in the lower right corner, you see turn thread, turn thread, auto code. If you click on that, it opens the box on the right and it will help and walk you through the, fill in the information required so that you can tell it what it is you have to do and what lengths, and it can create and give you some code to begin with and help you through that part. If you use the Alcart CNC wizard that we offer, it also has some information for you. And on that page, you can click on reference and then programming help, syncom, generic information, and then you'll see here is a PDF for link threading. It gives you some detailed information of how to develop that code. It doesn't give you the code, but it shows you how to work your way through it so that you can um, have some working knowledge as to how to do the link thread. Right, the advantages of thread whirling over the single point threading is it produces lower cutting forces and it, so it'll therefore increase your tool life. You can produce threads that would normally be very difficult or impossible to single point thread. Some whirling inserts can be reground depending on the type, uh, the original type or round uh, form tools that you could grind and reset. Now, the setup's more rigid for long threads because you don't have to worry about the pullback if you're doing it in one pass. If you're machining with multiple cutters instead of one. There's no chip wrapped issues because this is a, like a milling operation, so there's very small chips that wash away with the cooling. It produces a better surface finish with less chance of chatter once you've dialed in the parameters for the part that you're doing 
the depth of cut that you're cutting. And there's no need to pre-turn the major diameter before thread. And a little note there that within the max depth of cut of the insert, when the inserts are made, there's an actual uh, depth of cut that it can, it'll max out at, and then it'll stop being effective for you. Some te technical information for thread whirling. The cutting inserts are mounted on a whirling ring that goes into the thread whirling head. And those are rotated at a relatively high speed. The main spindle is rotated at a low RPM or controlled by the C axis. C axis usually gives you a, a much better control and better surface finish than the RPM because of the low RPM you'd be running at. So the thread's generated when the Z axis is given a feed rate. And the feed rate is going to be a thread pitch in either inches per rev or inches per minute. The cutting process is very similar to milling because it's multiple inserts mounted on a whirling ring, cutting the same amount of material during each full revolution. During the machining, each insert cuts intermittently. During each cut, the depth of the cut changes. As the cut starts, the amount of gradually increases until it reaches its maximum depth. You can see down in the lower right, as it comes around, it start, engages the material, gets to its highest point at center, and then starts backing away as it pulls out. And the whirling head is set to the helix angle of the thread to provide the side clearance for the cutters. So unlike a die, you're not, all the teeth aren't cutting at the same time. Only one tooth cut, or maybe you might have three that engage, depending on diameters, of engage with the material at the same time. Sorry, I didn't mean to have sound on there. All right, thread welds. The bone screws are very complex threaded components, usually requiring numerous hours of process development setup debugging, and cycle time. Thread whirling is the most efficient means to produce difficult OD threads by providing a solution that minimizes development of production time with faster cycles. The flexibility that thread whirling offers enables cost reductions with setup simplification, faster cycles, and greater throughput. Now, not, to get, not to get confused with the fact that a standard short length thread, single pointing, would be faster, and would be less costly to do single point threading. But these bone screws aren't normal. They have usually very long, a lot of surface contact with the insert. So you really need to be very careful to get it set up right. So if you're doing a very short one, you're probably gonna be better single point threading, but thread whirling is very easy once you've done it a couple of times to make it happen. Couple animations here showing a single pass from the bar stock to the finished thread. So you see on the right, it's showing the bar stock, and as the thread whirler goes across, it's just removing all that material. Now we use high pressure squirting into the head to flush the chips away so it doesn't get in between the cutter, the next cutter, and the part itself. We want to make sure we get those chips out of there. The numbers of the cutters or the teeth can vary, and the direction of the cut could also vary. So you can do right hand, left hand threads. Um, years ago, we had, I had an instance where the insert was designed and ground the inserts and de delivered them to me, and they had made them with the angles backwards. So I had to actually swing the helix the opposite way, and instead of using the insert at the top of the circle, I was using the insert at the bottom of the circle, you know, just because the insert designer um, had drawn it incorrectly. And some questions you might have is what style which style whirling head should I use? Which style cutter head is best? How many inserts should I need? And how do I calculate and set the head angle of the, of the whirling head? Over the years, we've had many different whirling units available. Uh, originally, they were 15 degree capable. They slid up in the gang, uh, very long shafts on the older style machines that engaged the gear. Uh, we move it from machine to machine. Sometimes we had to replace the gear because the gear lengths were slightly different. Uh, the center one you see here was also 15 degree. This was for a K16 machine. It was side mounted from the, the gang there. Uh, we did have the turret mounted ones for some of the older M machines. Now on the, on the newer ones, the machines that we have available now, this BTW series is 25 degree capable. So as the thread, as the bone screws got more complex, we needed more angle for these, especially when they come to some of them that have double lead threads. The helix angle went well beyond the 15 degrees that we originally had, and we needed to get more angle to it. So in order to do that, the head had to get larger. 
so that we had more swing to it so we could get the helix angle where we needed it. Now we do have a chart available. So this one here is showing the current machines that we offer and the different units for it in different helix angles capable for each part number. There's another one down further along in here, you'll see. Uh, the cutter head choices, there's different ones. We have all the way up to 12 inserts, shown in this picture with a single lead, six inserts with a single lead. Uh, the, the lower left is 12 insert, but a double lead. If you look close, you can see there's actually two teeth in one insert down there. And the middle here was the original style, which are the circular form tools. And it was three cutter head, cutter inserts in there. Lower right is nine inserts, single lead, cutter ring. There's different manufacturers for these that offer different configurations of it for you. So the three insert system had these round circular form tools that we would set uh, with a master and set the cutting edge up against the master and set all three of them the same and then we could cut. And as they got dull, we could grind them back and grind them back and until it was eventually so short that it, we, could, we could no longer hold it stable in its position. So we'd have to replace the inserts. The newer ones, not so easy to, to regrind, but they're very easy to change. And you come up with multiple edges on the inserts, whether it's the triangle one here or the top notch type style that you see down on the lower right. Um, you can get different configurations. Uh, the drawing in the center middle is showing a shadow graph view of a dual lead insert. Uh, so dual lead insert, obviously you have the leading edge is gonna be programmed all the way to its depth. So when it gets to that point and pulls out, the second lead actually didn't finish because it pulled out at the same time. So you have the second lead did not make it all the way to the end. So what we would do there is we disengage from the material. We rotate the part 180 degrees, re-engage the part using the front lead edge to finish the back lead, the second lead that did not get completed. So we can finish a dual lead insert using that method. All right, so here's a view of a, a nine insert cutter head close up, looking down inside of it when the, where the screw is just finished and it pulls away. So you can see I have an IC inside of this of 12 millimeters, so it's 472 thousandths. So as the diameters change, if they get larger, you gotta you need to know that because if you start to disengage the part and you re-engage at the underneath side, you're gonna damage your part, break your inserts and so forth. Right, the whirling cutter ring inserts and suppliers, there's many of them out there and we're getting more all the time. Uh, for many years, it was uh, Gen Genevieve Swiss. Gen Swiss has offered whirling rings. They offer inserts for them. Uh, they also offer some units that uh, MCC doesn't have for certain machines that uh, they had manufactured for them. Uh, there's NTK Cutting Tools has cutter rings and inserts for theirs. Schwanog's been making them for a long, long time. Sandvik has them and there's more all the time coming out. So you have many choices as to what you're going to go with on this. Uh, everybody has their favorite tooling manufacturer. So chances are that uh, most of them have this or you can talk to them and they will develop it for you. So then how many inserts do you actually need? Well, the number of inserts you use will, has a direct result on what RPM you can run and still maintain the best quality part. The lower number of inserts requires you to run the part or the bar stock slower to improve the surface finish. Running the RPM slower increases the cycle time, of course, and the chip load on the inserts It's working harder. The high part RPM with the rigid setup will result in a shorter cycle time, smaller chip load, and longer tool life. The cutter RPM, the teeth, how fast the teeth are spinning, will be determined by the insert grade, just like a turning insert in the material you're cutting. So you want to run the cutters as fast as the tooling manufacturer, whoever made your inserts would recommend on the material that you're cutting. And then the bar stock RPM or C axis rotation feed rate is what you're going to control. So the more inserts you have, the faster you can rotate the part and maintain the surface finish you're looking for. Got some views of different units mounted in different machines. So in the upper left, you can see in an L20, showing the head mounted in the end position, whether that's 10, two position 10 usually on that. Uh, on the lower right is the M series machines. It's M20 or M32, the gang, it's, it's uh, mounted on the opposite end, still tool 
10 position, 9 or 10 position, depending on the machine. There's an older chart showing um, all the different units that are available and who they're available from. This has been improved and increased over the years, uh, but this has some of the machines that the first chart that you saw didn't have, so I wanted to include this in here. You can see the A20, 220, A320, the A32, K16, and so forth. It shows you which unit that you need, what the degree adjustable helix angle, acceptable helix angle is, and what position it's going to mount in. The ones that you see here, like T13 plus T12, means you're going to put it in position 13, and it's going to use up position 12 also. Now, the first unit that we developed with the 25 degree was the BTW 1000. That one there gave us the 25 degrees on an L720 is when this was developed. And now we can bring it up and we can swing the helix angle to the 25 degrees. The coolant had a coolant mount block added to the side of it so that we could mount short, stubby, high pressure coolant lines and squirt from the front end so that we're flushing the chips out of the head. It's a mistake a lot of people make is they squirt the coolant in from the back in this angle. Very easy to get the line in there. But at that point, when you ever have a slow guide bushing rotation, you're blowing the chips into the guide bushing, possibly getting them into the slots, especially with high pressure coolant, and creating more guide bushing issues as that's happening. Hey, Randy, you, uh, sorry, there's a question okay. about uh, the, does the depth of the cut matter to decide how many inserts to use? Not necessarily the depth of the cut. It'd be how fast you're rotating it. Um, what I found is, you, you know, the, the number of inserts you use. If you buy one of these, say you buy a 12 insert cutter ring. Now the 12 insert cutter ring, and you'll see a picture coming up um, of that. And with that one there, the inserts are very close together. So the chips that you're making, the little curls that it's chopping off could get stuck between the teeth and create a problem. So you may not want to go with 12. You could go with the nine. Um, or the six or even the three. I did an experiment in the past where I used a 12 insert cutter ring, but I only put three inserts in it. I just had to rotate the bar very slowly and I proved out my process using just three inserts. Then once I had it all proved out and I didn't waste 12 inserts because I made a programming mistake. Now I, I had it all dialed in. I put all 12 inserts in there, adjust the RPM for the multiple inserts and I can go from there. So it kind of comes down to cost. Uh, as to what you need on that, all right? So then the BTW 2000 came along and this let us put it in the A220 and now the A320, also in the L220 series type eight and 10, goes in the end position. And again, the size of these, because we had to make the head larger in order to include the 25 degree capability, it ends up taking up a station next to it because you swing the helix, it's going to interfere if you had a tool next to it something to be aware of on some of these. All right. Also, the BTW 2000 would go into the L220 Type 12, but not in the B axis position. It would go in the position next to it, which would be position nine or nine and eight next to the uh, next to the, the B axis head. In case you don't want to replace the B axis head, you just need to whirl an insert, well, whirl some parts on this. Uh, and the same would be it would apply to the L32 Type 12. All right, so then the BTW 2000, the L32 type 8 and 10, it would go on the end. Uh, also on the M432 type 5 and type 7, it would the stationary. You set it in here, you cock it at the angle and tram it into the helix angle that you need and lock it down at that point. Uh, some of these, as you see, the same units being used, but what's changing here is the mounting blocks that attach it to the gang plate. Those change. So there's designations as to which machine it's going to go into because of that. The actual working head is the same. It's the pieces above it that change. Okay. And there's a BTW 2000 on the L220 type 12. I think we showed it in the last page too, but also the L32, the same thing. And here's a, that chart again showing on that 2000, the BTW 2000 04 for, for which machine. It, L220 type 12 and so forth. So these dash numbers, they're designating what the blocks are up above it so that you can mount it to the machine that you intend to, to apply it to. And came the BTW 3000. As we came out with the L20E, the evolution, this one had that 
big arm off to the side so you can do cross work or face work with it. So instead of taking that out and removing all of that capability and plugging the, the unit in that would go up above it, the, uh, the BTW 2000, we had the, came up with the 3000 so we could plug it into that arm. And this gave us the capability of keeping all of our cross slide tools and one of the cross slide tools in this head. We do interfere with the middle one here. So the whirling head mounts in the bottom because we swing it for the helix angle, it actually interferes with the, the position right above it. So you lose that one position. And the BTW 3100 uh, along the same lines, but it applies to the L220 type eight and 10 and the L220 type 12, right? Which is proper units for it to mount into the same concept. So you can keep an extra tool up above it. And there's the uh, chart that shows you the designation depending on which machine you're using and what your degree, helix degree capable capability is, 15 degrees on the 3100. Okay. I've got a question here. Uh, yep. Is it easy to set up a, a whirling head? Does Citizen offer preset parameters for diameter, core, or longitude? Uh, we could give you numbers that'll get you close. But you're going to see in a little bit where you actually the best thing is for you to tram it in to get true position. You can, just like any tool holder, when we put it in a machine, we want to actually tram it in to make sure it knows where the center of the guide bush and the center of the part is going to be. Uh, so we can get you close, but you're still going to want to tram it in when you first put it in to guarantee that you're there so that everything is on center. Okay. So the BTW 4000 came along as we came up with the M432 Type 8. So this is the B-axis M machine when it came out. The BTW 4000 has just added blocks up to it so that it allows it to mount up into the head, stay out of the way. We still have the four cross slide tools and all the stick tools available for that. Then came the BTW 5000 for the L220 Type 12 used on the B axis, and the BTW 6000, the L32 Type 12, the D25 Type 8, and the M532 Type 8. All these are the B axis. They take place of the B axis head that comes in the machine. So now you have full programmability of this, of the whirling head. So you can, instead of setting it at an angle, you can tell it which, which angle to index to, and then you can do your cut. Uh, now they keep changing the, the parts, the bone screws especially, where they want the threads to bind up so they have a, a changing helix angle as you're cutting. You can do that with the B-axis head. All right, so the BTW 5000 and 6000, this chart here shows you which machines and which designation for that. Again, it's the max helix angle of 25 degrees adjusted by the B-axis from the control. It's for making different lead screws on one part. Uh, we see those screws come up all the time where you have multi, you have the same shape thread, but different helix angles, which in the past would take two thread whirling units to do. Well, with the B axis, in those instances, you can just change the angle from the program and continue on with your thread or your part. So the, the BTW 5000 on the L220 Type 12, it mounts in the end position. Position 10, you tram that in, then you make sure that it's straight. You may have to adjust the B-axis grid if it's not showing it as zero when you have it at zero, and you can correct that. The BTW 5000 on the M40, M416 Type 8, same concept. Goes on the end, which is unfortunately is right inside the door, right in your face when you open the door. And here we have one where showing the B-axis thread whirling, a little video of it running. So you can see where it brought it, brings it up in front of the guide bushing and then indexes to the angle. Uh, some of the helix angles we're trying to maintain are so great that if we have it at the wrong angle, we could actually contact the guide bushing as we approach to cutting position. So here we can go in with it straight and then kick it to the angle. And then even when we, once we pull the part back, we can uh, straighten it out before we pull away. Right now you're seeing where the B axis 
is slightly changing as it's cutting. It's rotating the B axis during the cut. That's the advantage of having the B axis, having the thread whirl unit on the B axis. All right, some setup decisions that you have to make as the cutting location. I mentioned earlier that you could be cutting at the top of the circle or the bottom of the circle. That's going to determine which way you rotate the helix angle on the unit. Um, in years past, there was a there was a time where certain machines we could not use the top insert to go below a certain diameter, so we just used the bottom one and come up underneath it. it gave us the same result, just the helix was was twisted in the other way, so we're using the bottom insert. A um, couple of setup decisions, depending on where you're doing, is going to be which way to swing it. It's just a matter of if you look at the part that you're going to make as if you're the insert approaching the part, then you'll be able to figure out which way to, to rotate the cut. I yes. uh, got a question here. Yep. Uh, what is the longest length uh, thread we can machine at 25 degrees? At 25 degrees, um, I I think it would be the, the stroke of the machine before you'd have to stop because it's not going to contact the the angle as it comes out. That's what it's designed for. If you tried to go beyond 25 degrees, now you're looking at if the it, as the length starts to grow, it's going to start contacting the angle of the um, of the cone that you see at the back of the whirling head. You see up here, it'll start actually coming out and hitting over in here. If you can see my cursor or not. That answer the question, Joe. Yep, thank you. All right, and once we install the, install the whirling unit, we want to trim the holder to find center, like somebody was asking. We're going to put this in and we're going to trim across, across the head to make sure that we're sitting in there straight, if it's a manual one, or, or to index to B, B0 on the B axis. We make sure it's straight. Now we're going to come in with an indicator from probably the sub spindles, the way I do it, and tram inside there to find my X, Y, zero, my center point of the of the whirling unit to the spindle. So I know that that is set right. And that's going to go on my prep page. And like I said, we can give you numbers for each machine that'll get you close, but you really need to do this anytime you put it in any machine and from one machine to the next, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, so you're going to want to tram this in and know that you're there so that you're truly cutting on center. Uh, we've offered for years a, a Excel spreadsheet to help you get through some of this. This is something that was created 15 plus years ago to just for basic information, and I've added stuff to it over the years. So what we have here is you put in the, if you fill in all the, the blue letters that you see in here, we're gonna, add, we're gonna edit these as we wanna go. Put in the lead. The major diameter, high and low, or, the, or to get the mean. If they give you the mean, just type that in one of them, you'll be fine. Same with the minor, high and low, or, or the mean. You put in the length of the thread that you're going to cut. The bar RPM, if you know what it's required or, or recommended from the insert manufacturer. The cutter RPM for the surface footage. The gear ratio. Some of the older machines, we had different gear ratios we could put in here to figure out what we're going to do, uh, just so we know what to, what to program. On the stock diameter, uh, if you put the stock diameter in here, what this is going to do is when you set all these in here, what I didn't mention was down here the helix angle. Because we came out with multiple angled capable, capable units, we want to put in here whichever one you're using. So if you have a 15 degree unit, make sure you put 15 in here. Because when it calculates out with the information you put above, the center box is going to tell you whether it's acceptable for that angle or if it's not acceptable. It'll actually change if it goes beyond it. So what it calculated out was right here, the drop over an inch in the actual helix angle. So with these parameters, it's 20.59802 is the angle of the head. But the way I always did it is I tram it in using a drop indicator. So I wanted to know what the, what the drop was over one inch travel. So I could put that in the machine and easily dial that in. So we have, we get this. So once we know that number, we put a drop indicator on the side of the head and we tram across it till we get that number set. The more accurate you make this angle setting, the more tolerance you're gonna have from minor to major for your thread. So if you're ever cutting one and you're having trouble maintaining the tolerance, when you get the minor diameter where it belongs, the major diameter is too big or too small, you probably don't have the head set just right for that insert, as the for that thread. So 
All right. Some of the other information on here, it's just giving you uh, if you're going to using C axis, it's going to tell you once it sees that information on the top, it'll tell you what the C command is going to be, the W command and the F command for that lead in order to use that. And also the chip load that you're going to have on there, the cutting time at those RPMs that you can expect the actual thread pass to take. Okay. So we, we needed that information so that we could trend this in over an inch. So the same numbers that you saw pop up on that are right here. And now I set my drop indicator on here and I zero it out. And then I move using the, the hand wheel, I tram across an inch and I keep swinging the head until I get that number over an inch. I get it set just right. I keep locking it down until I hit it perfect. Again, the better you get this set, the better or more tolerance you're going to have from your uh, Minor diameter, pitch diameter really is what is effective. Okay. Are there any other questions there, Joe? So far, so good, Randy. All right. So I got a few program examples. There's so many variations of what you may run into um, that you could email your dealer or MCC and we can send you something that we've seen and done um, so that we can help you get through it. We want you to be successful and we'll help you any, any way we can. So here's some samples using uh, the bar RPM, spindle RPM, um, and how different processes that I've used in the past. So this one here was on an M machine from the turret, cutting with the cutter spinning at 6,000 RPM, but the bar was only spinning at 20. And when I came in and engaged the part and went through. As you can see up above, I do have shifts for this, uh, depending on wh what unit you have and what Will, depend, will determine what the shifts are you're gonna use. If it's from the gang, you got a 590 shift for the W, um, but as you swing the head at the helix angle, if you use the number 590, because you twist it, you may actually make contact a little bit before you're expecting. So you get in there and you start you know, making an offset, making an offset because you're trying to get the length of the thread and all of a sudden you chip your inserts, it could be that your shift was wrong and it started from the wrong place. So you may want to back up and try that again. Uh, we got two questions here. Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, since you indicate the thread whirling head with sub with the sub spindle, can the hidden offset affect you later to find center G890? G890? Um, They're saying G890, G891, the hidden page. Right. I, I don't use G890. I just use the prep page when I for this head. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't use it that way. So if you put it in G890, I would assume it's going to pull it up the same way. Would you agree, Brian? Sorry, I turned off my mic. Yes. I mean, you could do it that way, but often the next one you're going to take out and use different tools. So you typically don't want to put it in G891, but you could. It's your choice. So I put it in the prep page because you know I may finish doing this thread whirling job and all of a sudden I'm going to pull the thread whirling unit out and put that that uh, ID head or, or cross milling head back in there. And that's where I would use the G890 was so it's set for that head. So when I pop that back in, I just clear out the prep page from what I did for the thread whirling unit and I go on from there. Uh, second question is, is an extended nose guide bush always required? It, no, like any part, it really depends on the stability of the part itself. Larger diameters, you may not need it. Smaller diameters, you probably will need. It. But you have to be aware, as you use an extended nose guide bushing, you're thinking, if you're thinking of the 590 position of the cross, the gang tool mount, when you twist that, that 590 gets smaller. So you need to keep that in mind and trig it out so that you know at what point with that helix angle make the inserts or the whirling head contact the extended nose guide bush. So you got to be careful with that. That it, Joe? Yep, thank you. Okay. All right, the program example for the A220 type seven, and then this would be from the gang rack, cutting it, it was 303 in this particular one here, and this was a double lead thread. Um, this is a Fanuc control. So uh, the code really is basically the same. Um, there's not that much difference between our code formats from uh, Mitsubishi to Fanuc in most cases. There's a few things with decimal points are different. All right, so this shows you that I call up the thread whirling head tool nine, I get it down in position first. I put in the shifts. Here's the 472, which is the 12 millimeter 
is the IC of the tips of the inserts and the 5905, which is the shift out in W, the C position. This one here, I go up, I, I pull the stock back to minus two because I want to make sure I don't contact the material as I approach. And then I, I just did a feed rate uh, coming into it, G1, I'm using, sorry, I'm using C axis here for the feed rate. So I give it a Z position, an uh, H rotation, and a feed rate of the C axis speed rotation. Get to the end and I taper it out and wrote in a 180 degree rotation. And then I pulled the stock back. I disengaged the, the part here and I pulled the stock back, rotate 180 degrees. So I started at zero up here. Now I'm gonna go at 180. This is where I re-engage with the leading edge of the insert, but on the trailing lead of the thread on the part so that I can finish the second lead. I come in, angle in to engage it, go to the same length and then pull out the same way. And then I can pull back cancel my shifts and move on from there. So that's how we deal with the, the double lead threat and getting the second lead to actually be finished. Uh, I have a question here. Does prep page equal man set? Uh, that's where man set enters the values when you tram it in and you just do input, it puts it in on the prep page, sorry. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Right, here's an example We're using C axis for part rotation, but a little using some variables so that you can uh, use the same program over and over again to try to help you and not create code from scratch every time. Uh, so what I've done here is I use a variable. I put in the thread length, the Z command that I need to give it, the thread pitch, the feed rate, the lead rate, right? And then the RPM for the whirling. So I can change it quickly if I needed to. And I use it for some calculation. So I enter those in here. And then if I do that, I can take everything below this and I can use it over and over again for different parts, unless I run into something really special. All right, so I come up now, I, I engage the C-axis, and now I do the calculations using what I did up above. So I come up with my degrees of rotation. It's how, how many degrees to rotate the C-axis during my cut. The pullout distance, the taper I need to pull out at. The rotation feed rate is my speed that I'm, I need to feed the, the C axis around so that I can cut, like the bar RPM. And all this will work through that to cut, do your cut. Okay. Again, it's variables so that you can use this code, you can cut and paste it in and change a few things, mostly just change these up here and you be, should be good to go. A little bit more, uh, carrying the macro to a little bit further and this one was with the double lead also. Same kind of thing. I use different variables, but I actually did my calculations. Different shift I put in there. I call up the tool, start at zero, work my way down the part, and do cut my lead all the way to the end, taper away, pull out, pull back, re index 180 degrees, re engage the part, and finish the second lead with the front edge, cutting edge of the insert. Again, these are so you can copy and paste from this, or I could send it to you so that you can have it and use it over and over again. All right, so that was really just making the thread whirling a bit simple for you to use. It's, it's a little scary when you start out, but it's really not hard once you've done it a couple of times. It's faster to set up once you know how to do it. It's, it's faster to get your first part off the machine using thread whirling than trying to do like the link threading. Um, but not everyone has has the whirling unit that they need available or the inserts aren't on hand and need the parts immediately. The link threading can do that also. Oh, are there any other questions that we can answer for you? Uh, so far, nothing, but I'll give it another minute here. Okay. Again, thread whirling is just a, it's an awesome feature on the part, especially for bone screws where it's most popular. Um, but I've done parts in the past where I was screwing two parts together in the process and I thread whirled one, rigid tapped the other. And once I've established my beginning points of the two, I was able to screw parts together in the machine and have them come out completed and screwed together even. Uh, we were asked here, uh, are you guys making the spreadsheet available? Yeah, that spreadsheet's been available for many years. You can ask, um, 
your local dealer or email someone at MCC and we'll send it to you without a problem. It's not the only one out there either, but it's, that's one that I've I created and been using for over 15 years. Uh, so far, so good. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. All right, so it, a little bit of time. I know this was recorded and Joe will make it available so that you could download the video and be able to look at it again. And again, my name is Randy Nickerson. If there's anything I can do for you or answer for you or find an answer for you, I'd be happy to. Thank you very much, Randy. I hope you guys enjoyed today's event. If anybody comes up with any topics they would like us to touch on, please reach out to your distributors or any of us at MCC. Uh, thank you again for joining and thank you again, Randy. You're welcome. Thank you.